Could somebody tell people downstairs that we're getting ready to start? Thank you. Good day, everyone. Good day. All right. Not really a good morning because we're not morning this morning. We're actually a little bit happier than that today. No morning necessary. I wanted to uh, put up here yesterday, I was uh, real quick, and we didn't get this information out. And uh, how many people were here last night? How many, excuse me, I should do it the other way. How many people were not here last night? Would I like to know. Well, we got one, two, three, four, just a few of you. Okay, good. So we've got a, a, new, a new crew, about five people. The House of Prayer. I, I operate, and I recommend that you consider what I'm getting ready to say. I operate under the testamentary trust called the House of Prayer. I don't know if you've read the book called the Bible. Jesus' uh, words are recorded there. He said, my father's house shall be called the House of Prayer. It's a testamentary trust with the name of the house. And so everything I do is under the House of Prayer. I have the ancient and previously decided book of the law, 1611 authorized King uh, James Version, to qualify that name. So we're here gathered today under the House of Prayer. It's for all people, so you're all right. You're in, you're in the House of Prayer for all people. You, if you're one of those, it's, all, it's for you. You, can, you qualify. I have an email address that you can take a picture of here, and, and, you, and you can reach me at wineandoil at yahoo.com. My name is Daniel Joseph. It's what's given to me. Actually, it's a lot of people have that name. I really can't qualify it as my own, but uh, I do use it. And uh, you can reach me at this email address, wineandoil, W-Y-N-A-N-D-O-Y-L, at yahoo.com. Hey, Steve, would you check and see if that camera's been turned on to record right there? No? Well, that would have... All right, good. The House of Prayer, that's what we're here doing this morning. We'll start this over. The House of Prayer, we're gathered under the House of Prayer. And, uh, and this morning, we're here gathered under what our Father said through Jesus Christ, the House of Prayer. Everything I do is under the House of Prayer. A matter of fact, I highly recommend you make a sign and put it on your door. Qualify the jurisdiction of your home. That's what I have on top of my door right at my house, the House of Prayer. That's the jurisdiction. When you walk through that door, it's God's house. No arguing in the house of God. It's a good thing to have there. Keeps you, keeps you safe and home. Wine and oil at yahoo.com is a way to reach me. It's an email. Myhousesshallbecalled.com is a web page where I do freely give as I operate as Archbishop of the House of Prayer. Let me qualify that so you don't think I'm being a little bit haughty and arrogant. Archbishop, we define it as uh, a bishop is a servant. Archbishop is a servant's servant. I stand as a servant servant to you today. I would like to see bishops in every city, in every co county, in every municipality growing up so that the people can be in, uh, trained and share the information. And that's one of the things we put on that webpage. You can, go er you can read the qualifying, which you need to be qualified as, uh, as a bishop there. We have uh, five members here. If y'all want to wave, wave your hand, wave your hand here so that say, so they know you from the house of prayer here locally. There's one, two. You can you see the house of prayer? No, the ones that meet on Thursday night. I, I only see uh, only see two of our group here today. One, two. There they are. It, it, Doyle, there's Doyle, and Donnie's over there. So you can uh, look at the look up those guys while you're here. Just talk to them. If you're in the area and you want a place to gather, you want people to gather with and keep learning, we meet every Thursday night, uh, like clockwork, for about the past 10 years. And what we do is we study. We put out information. And that's how we met, uh, met with David, by doing this. That's how we met with Kerry Zolman, who's going to be coming next month to visit with us. He's going to be our, our, our speaker coming next month. And, uh, and that's how I found out about David Strait, because because this is one of the things we do. We, we literally go through all the information that's out there. And believe me, you, if you get on your internet, there's a lot of information. We have to weed through a lot to find somebody that's qualified, that has something good to say, and has fruit. I mean, there's a lot of people that say a lot of stuff out there. You know, you can find out a lot of people tell you to just file out a UCC1 form and become a secured party creditor, and you're about a big And never do that, OK? Huh? Never do that, by the way. Yeah. I did that about 15 years ago. <laughs> 
You're going to talk about that a little bit today, by any chance? Okay. okay. Yeah, so today we're going to have, have David speak to us. For those of you that are new, David Strait, we, I, I don't have a long-standing history with David in the past, but I plan to be working with David in the future, as if, if, if he'll have me. When we, have, uh, we have a connection in that we both have a burning desire to see God's people set free, and we have people, and people to be um, free from the boot on their neck. That's the best way I can explain it to you. Um, for those of you new ones, we have lunch this afternoon, fantastic lunch. Rebecca and, and Rhonda and her sister Zeddy's going to be um, putting this stuff out. And Donnie and Doyle, they've got tanga. We've got beans and rice and, and uh, taco salad. I shouldn't say rice. Taco salad, my bad. We have taco salad down there, some cauliflower. We've got melons. We've got cookies. We've got coffee. So you've got plenty of food here. We probably have enough to feed um, this many people like three times. So we'll have probably dinner as well. We want to make sure. My mama was Italian. She did not like uh, having uh, we had to have a lot of food. We just, you know, I had her. Her uh, family had 14 brothers and sisters. My dad had seven brothers and sisters, and we only had three in our family. But uh, then I went and had nine children. So we, we, I like to cook for a lot of people. So anyway, good morning to you. Uh, actually, good day to you. I told you it was no morning this morning. Let's get this uh, sh a show going. We're going to take a break in about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. We can go get a cup of coffee, visit one one another. One of the beauties of these. A local type of seminars where you don't watch it on YouTube, but you get to visit and you get to network. I really want you to do that, to meet one another, share with each other your names, your contacts, and actually um, develop develop some connections. In this room, to in this room tonight, I'm looking around. Um, I, know, I know a lot of you. Um, I, I know some old timers that are here that have been at this a long time, and I'm really glad to see you. I don't know if you want your name mentioned on um, on the uh, tape that we're broadcasting out there, but I recognize you and I honor you. I honor you. I honor you. I honor you. I know that you. I honor you. I honor you. I know that you've been doing this a long time. There's some people that have been really at it a long time that have been in the trenches. And I give you honor today. This has not been an easy fight. So with, um, with that being said, we're going to learn some techniques today. The, our purpose today, so you know, is to learn some, it's an advanced class to learn some tools that we can use. And so... No further ado, I want to give this floor over to David. Can we give him a warm welcome for the audience? Let him know that everyone's appreciating him today. Thank you, David, for being here. Thank you. I'm a little slow this morning. I didn't get a lot of sleep, but uh, I seldom do. How many people are uh, President Trump's fans? How many Obamas? Oh, that's good to see. So, see, uh, if, if you go visit the White House gift shop, when President Obama gave out had hats, they used to say United States. Under President Trump, they say United States of America. Okay? In the gift shop, you can buy hats just like this, minus this. This is the presidential seal. These are the ones the president hands you. Okay? So, on June 20th, I was meeting Melania in the Rose Garden for about 20 minutes, and President Trump came by and handed me this hat. And I told this story a little yesterday, but for those that don't know, I'm going to tell you again what I told him, because it's very important to what we're doing. Really quickly, I had to think of something to say, because <laughs> I knew I was only going to get about this much time in here, right? So what could I say that would... That would uh, maybe make a difference. And I said this. I said, President Trump, our 2018 census here in the United States says we have 327.2 million people. And our corporate charter, our constitution, which runs government, that's how government's supposed to operate, says we need one representative in Congress for every 30,000 people. That means we need 10,907 congressmen, and we have 435. 
and Congress operates off the Mason's meeting manual, which means 435 is not a quorum when 10,907 are required, which means nothing Congress has done, no law they've passed, no act of Congress is lawful. There is no government. Government ceases to exist. They are sin die. And he looked at me, and he almost brought me to tears. He says, that's right. That's why I signed executive order restoring the Republic of the United States of America, and now it's up to you. Okay. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's two or more of everything in this country. There's two of you. There's two cities here in Fayette. There's two counties here in Washington County. There's two states of Arkansas, and there's two United States of America. There's the United States Corporation, and then there's the de jure government of the United States of America that lives within each one of us. And now it's up to you. Okay? you got to put it into effect. you got to let the United States Corporation know that they have no authority. None. Not one of these police officers, not one of these city council members has any authority whatsoever unless you consent, unless you give it to them. And if nothing else I teach today matters, it's that right there. If you don't understand, you do not perceive these people as having any authority. They don't have it. The FBI has no authority. They were created in 1908 by a secretary of the Department of Justice, not an act of Congress. Our Constitution says Congress creates agencies. They have no corporate charter to even exist. And when they asked Congress for a charter, they were denied formally. So don't be thinking of these people as authority. They were put into place to do one thing and one thing only, and that is protect the deep state and further the new world order. That's it. Okay? They handle six crimes. IMF-related crimes like banking and child and sex trafficking and other things. So they go to your police, your local police, and they come in there and they tell the police chiefs and the county sheriffs and the state patrol, they tell them if a member of the public comes in and they have one of these six crimes, you don't handle it, you call us. And we'll be, bring in the best forensics there are and we'll come in in our suits and with fanfare and advertising and we always get our man. And we'll handle it. Don't you guys handle it. Okay? And then they come in, and most of the time they cover up a crime. Now, not IMF crimes. They are not going to cover that one up because they protect the banks. Because the bankers and the attorneys rule the world. Okay? All right. Nothing else I teach you. I had to say that again. All right, we got through that. Anybody read the book, Fruit from a Poisonous Tree? Okay, two, two people. All right, go get the book. Get the Law of Nations and get Fruit from a Poisonous Tree. Fruit from a Poisonous Tree was written by one of the first attorneys that I ever turned over to our side. Mel Stamper, and Mel and I are pretty good friends. And I wrote an affidavit of repudiation years and years ago. In fact, I've, I've, I've served it on seven presidents now. I send it to the President of the United States. You're not required to. You are required to send it to the Secretary of State. Every Secretary of State we've had under seven presidents has received that document. 
I've also sent it to every attorney general. I send it to the Secretary of State and the Attorney General in the state I was born, and I send it to the Secretary of State and the Attorney General in the state I chose to inhabit. And every time there's a regime change, I send it again. Why do I do that? I do it because I want them to know why I'm making this decision. And hopefully, somebody in their office will read it, and hopefully, it'll make a difference. Well, Mel Stamper read my affidavit of repudiation, and he put it, I think it's in the second chapter of his book. Now, he changed it to fit him, and I'm happy to give it to you, and you can change it to fit you, because there's going to be things in there that only apply to me and don't apply to you. So you got to make it yours. It's your document. When anyone gives you an affidavit, Boy, you better read it, you better study it, you better look it over, and you better know what's in it. Because if you make it yours, it's yours. It's not theirs anymore. It's yours. And you might have to defend it. So you better know what's in it. Don't take people's affidavits, change them, and put them online, and then have somebody say, oh, this is David Strait's affidavit. Because there's websites out there with my affidavits that look nothing like my original affidavit. But they tell people they're mine. Okay? And they're out there. So just be careful. Ask if you don't know. Okay? But an affidavit... of repudiation... is one of the few documents that's actually required to change your status. Now, for those that aren't, weren't here yesterday, I talked a lot about status, standing, and jurisdiction, three most important things in the law. And we really didn't get into it enough yesterday. We talked a lot about status, but very little about standing and jurisdiction. Affidavit of repudiation is something, if you look in uh, the U.S. Code, and some, some people who are common law students for a long time, and they go, well, why are you using the U.S. Code? Why are you using their law? Because the U.S. Code was put there for we the people to hold government accountable. Not for government to hold us accountable. See, they can't use U.S. code on an American state national. But I can use it on them. Now, they can use it on a U.S. citizen because that in which you create, you control. I'm a we the people, an American state national that created government, and a U.S. citizen was created by government. So if you're tired of them controlling you, you've got to know who you are. And you've got to change your status. It's one of the most important things in the law. Status, standing, and jurisdiction. I say it over and over. USC. Title 8. Section 1101. Section 1101 is your definitions of status. So people think... Most police officers would like to believe there's only one status in the United States. Everybody's a U.S. citizen or they're an illegal. That's it. That's what they look at. Are you a U.S. citizen or are you illegal? No. There's lots of statuses. They list them right there. All kinds of them. You can be a United States citizen. You can be a U.S. national. You can be a state citizen. You can be a state national. You can be all kinds of different things. But there's only one with limited diplomatic immunity as per the Geneva Conventions. That's a state national. Why is that? Because we're Oregonians and Californians and Wisconsinites and Floridians and Arkansas. Okay? That's what we are. 
that this is our nation state, right? Where we choose to inhabit is our nation state, unless we've been there for seven years or born there. See, I was born in California. Lived there till I was five. Then my dad moved us to Oregon. And I've been an Oregonian ever since. I've traveled the entire world, and I have lived in other states, especially while I was in the military. But my home is Oregon. I'm an Oregonian. I've been there the majority of my life. So I choose to inhabit Oregon. I don't reside there. I'm not a resident. You don't want to be a citizen, a person, or a resident of anything. If you do, you need CPR because you're dead. And that's an easy way to remember it. Citizen, person, resident. The three things any court or any perceived authority, any police officer has to have is your tacit agreement of being those three things in order to have rule over you, in order to give you a traffic ticket a police officer has to get your tacit agreement that you're a person, a resident, and a citizen, and he knows how to do it within 15 seconds. Can I have your driver's license, proof of insurance, registration, please? You gather them up, you hand it to them, you just gave them tacit agreement that you're a citizen because you're an employee of government, you do what your boss tells you to do when he tells you to do it. That's a tough one to understand, isn't it? <laughs> Not really, everybody's shaking their head. No, I didn't think so either, all right? So what I'm trying to say is we can be very simple in the things that we do if we use the right language and we learn over and over again. So I'm telling you right now, an affidavit of repudiation is required. If I don't, if I start misspelling stuff, it's because I'm tired, okay? Is required. The second thing is you, what does the Constitution say? That we have to be safe in our papers and our effects, right? In the United States of America, we have two safety documents, depending on which jurisdiction we're in. We have a passport and we have a driver's license. One is if we're in private and one is with we're in public. See, again, like yesterday, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God gave me, man, dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and this is law. Those are our three jurisdictions, and there's only three jurisdictions. Everything else is venue or locus, okay? Say it again, two separate jurisdictions. So when I'm traveling in private, in my private automobile upon the highways, and the reason I say this a lot is because that's where most people begin their trouble with the court systems. And once they get into the system and they get that record running up with however many tickets or DUIs or whatever, the next step is you're going into a felony of some sort, all right? And then they just keep you locked in. They love you. They, they love you. They collect money off of you. They bond you every time you get a CUSIP number from the court, all right? And they make money. They're a private for-profit entity. So if you want to operate in the private, this is the document you hand them. You don't gather up your driver's license, proof of insurance, and your registration. <coughs> Leave your registration in your glove box. If you want to show them your proof of insurance card, I love to show them mine. I hold it up like this, and I go, yep, same company since 1979. And I set it right there on the console, out of his reach. I let him know I have insurance because I love my neighbor. Not because the, there's a statute that says I have to have it. It's because I want to protect my neighbor. The second one is, this is the only document I use while I'm traveling. And then you shut up. Anything else, you don't need to answer any further questions. Keep your mouth shut. Say, I don't answer questions. That's it, all I need to say. 
and you hand him the passport. He looks at it to make sure it's you. He can take it back to his car and he can scan that little code at the bottom right there. And all your information is going to pull up. Every bit of it. And then some. What I'm going to tell you is this is number one. Better quit setting that pin down. And a passport is number two. You want to be a state national? If you want to be a state national, it's up to you. You have the unalienable right of self-determination. You can be whatever the heck you want to be. Okay? And that's in every human rights document there is. See, we got to know our rights. Our rights come from God. But they are written down somewhere, or how would you say it? Uh, what's that? They are confirmed. That's a good word. There's lots of them probably we could use. But they are confirmed in various documents throughout the world. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Amendments 1 through 27, the, the, the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, our constitutions, our state constitutions. How many people have read their state constitution and know it? Two, three, four. The old timers. Yeah. Yeah, guys that have been doing this a while, okay, that know what they're doing. Why haven't you, others, read your state constitution? I read the Arkansas Constitution before I came here, and I studied it all several times. So I've read every state constitution. I've read the United States Constitution. Okay? I've read every act of Congress and every presidential speech and the entire United States Code and the entire IRS Code. You know what it says in in the United States, Title 26, which is the IRS code, that's the second area people get into trouble is with, the, with money, <laughs> taxes, okay? They come after you. They like to take your house, okay? They make money on houses, by the way. So I know I lost $9 million in real estate during the housing market crash, 2008. Everything I had for 35 years, I invested in real estate. Didn't lose everything, but I lost a big chunk before I knew what I knew today. I got smarter over time, too. I hope you guys do. <laughs> Maybe by the time we're dead, we'll have learned something. <laughs> All right? But Title 26 says, which is the IRS code, by the way, says no part of this title. Not its headers, not its footnotes, not its definitions, nor its body shall be construed as law. I'll leave that with you. What did I just tell you? I told you taxes are voluntary. A 1040 form is a gift to the government. All right? There's no law that says you have to pay taxes. Why? I'll tell you why. Because we asked the federal government to provide us with 19 essential governmental services and no more. And I said this yesterday, and I'm going to say it again, especially for the new people, and no more. Why is and no more so important? Because today they provide us with at least, I don't know, 6,000 6, to 20,000 services, and they force us at gunpoint to pay for it. They're voluntary. Taxes do not fund government anyway. They go to pay interest on the debt. So they get the money from the courts. Government is funded by the Department of Justice. Ask the Department of Fiscal Services. They'll tell you that. In fact, just go to their question and answer page on their website. I'm telling you to go to the Department of Fiscal Services website. Study it. Look at their forms. Look at their sample forms. You're going to learn a lot. 
It's going to show sample forms. Why does it show sample forms? Because the Department of Fiscal Services website is there for one reason and one reason only, to train your court clerks. It's not general public. It's <laughs> Why would the general public have any need whatsoever to go to the Department of Fiscal Services website? They don't. There's nothing on there for them. Everything is for court clerks all over the nation. All right? That's what they're there for. They're the accounting arm, the, the bean counters of the treasury. They cut and write all the checks for the treasury. The treasury sets interest rates and, and, and keeps analytical data. Okay? The Department of Fiscal Services writes the actual checks, the treasury checks. But they also wire transfer money to the courts, and they get a lot of money because of the courts. All right? Department of Justice is the largest contributor to the federal budget by far. And it says that right on their website. Look at the sample forms. You'll see things like penal sums and examples. And you'll start to look at some of those are like, depending on the crime, $2 million, $5 million, $7 million penal sum because you were charged with a crime. That's how much the court gets to collect or the government on behalf of the court, through the court, gets to collect. And then the judges get paid net retention, the prosecutors get paid net retention. Those are commissions, okay? So, two things that are required. Download the DS-11 form. You can do that right from the State Department's website, have it on your desk or wherever you're doing this at, kitchen table. Go on the computer to coppermoonshinestills.com. How do you spell copper? Two P's? He makes beautiful copper stills, by the way which can be used to make diesel fuel and distill water and moonshine. <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a good man. And he's been around a long time. And uh, he keeps up. And that's important. He keeps up. So follow the directions. You'll have to go to the left-hand side and work your way down. And there's one little thing that says, I forget the exact words, but it's about freedom. You'll spot it right off the bat, okay, if you want to be free or something like that. And then he'll show you how to fill out the DS-11 and get your proper passport and then start using it when you're operating in private, which is... 99% of the time for most people. I only have a driver's license because I get in a semi-truck every once in a while and I haul hay to places like California and Idaho from my ranch. If it wasn't for that, I'd throw the damn thing away. But when you're operating in commerce, you have dominion. Oops, i got to wash that mic. You have dominion over all three jurisdictions. Don't jump from one jurisdiction into the other because you think you have to always remain in common law? See, that's a big mistake of these people that they term sovereign citizens, all right? That's a terminology invented by the FBI, by the way, all right, to label you a terrorist because you are the enemy of the deep state. Anytime you stand up for your freedom and liberty, you're an enemy of the deep state. And who protects a deep state? The FBI, who has no congressional authority to even exist. Isn't that cool? See, we the people lay down the law. Not them. We the people laid down the law. We started with the law of nations. Our founding fathers knew that. Read the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Look at both sides of the argument. Most people just read one, the Federalist Papers. Read both sides. You'll see why this government was set up. And it was set up as a bottom-up government. 
starting in our townships and our neighborhoods and then our cities and then our counties and then our states and then our federal government. And what did they do? They flipped the whole thing over and now it's United States government, state governments, county governments, city governments. They're all subsidiary corporations. Since governments chose to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. Remember that. Okay? If you want these documents, ask, and we can give them to you. All right? You can get the book, Fruit from the Poisonous Tree by Melvin Stanford. It's in there. His version, but it doesn't matter. Make it yours. If you want to add things, add things that you feel are important. Now, don't go off the wagon and add a bunch of stuff that's going to get you in trouble or thrown in jail. <laughs> All right? Be reasonable, but call them out for the fraud that they are. Tell them the hardest decision you ever made, and it says that in mine, is to decide not to be a United States citizen. I was born in a military family. My grandfather was in the military, my dad was in the military, my older brother was in the military, I was in the military, my son was in the military. I grew up a patriotic son of a buck, probably the most patriotic guy you'd ever meet in your life. But I didn't know what I was supposed to be patriotic to. I got that wrong, and so did my whole family for generations. We got it wrong. We didn't realize our government was usurped right out from under us, in eight, starting in 1861. Okay? One communist president. Now, also, don't let anybody tell you you're a sovereign citizen. If they mention those two words together in the same sentence, you call them out immediately. Say, what are you, an oxymoron? Those two words don't go together. You cannot be a sovereign and be a citizen. And every president of the United States except our blessed Obama uh, has got up on TV and said the people are sovereign. So don't you act like that's a bad thing. Notice this is a purple pen. So is this. This is what I sign my name with. Every legal document I do is signed with this pen, or one just like it. My ink runs out, but it's a purple pen. Absolutely not. It's a contract pen color. Black is dead. Red is living. Put your thumbprint in red. Okay? Color of ink is important on a legal document. Most people don't know that. Some judges don't know that. Some prosecutors don't know that. They are compartmentalized legal idiots, just like we all are. Every one of us is a compartmentalized legal idiot. You know why? We were trained to be that way from kindergarten and probably before when your parents started telling you obey authority. No, you obey your mother and father because you honor them. You obey your grandparents because you honor them. But question authority or anybody who is perceived authority. <laughs> okay? Nothing I could, else I could teach you is more important than that. We have to. But don't be mean to them. Treat them as your neighbor. See, there's an important factor. Police officer walks up to my window. I roll my window down and I start talking before he gets a chance. Very important. I say, hi, officer. How you doing? How's your day going? I hope you're being safe out there. I really want you to go home to your family tonight. And I mean it. And I say it like I mean it. I truly do. And I smile and I let him know. We're the nicest people in the world. Especially people who want to be sovereign better be the nicest people in the world. Too many are getting shot, thrown in jail for no reason other than they were probably to perceived authority. 
Treat people as your neighbor. Love thy neighbor and do no harm, and you can't break any other law. Do you know that? Those are the only two laws we've got to live by. Honor God, love thy neighbor, and do no harm. That's it. That's all we got to do. And we can't break another single law out there. If I per put, like I said yesterday, if I put my turn signal on while I'm traveling down the road, it's because I want my neighbor and those around me to be safe, not because there's some stinking statute that tells me that. Rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're corporate bylaws. They're for employees of the corporation to follow. They're an employee handbook. Simple. Can't get any more important than those things right there. Keep the basics in your mind. You don't have to learn the details of everything. You don't. Be simple and keep it repeatable so that you can go out and do what I'm doing right here. I'm not here for my health. <laughs> it's hard on me. I work 20 hours a day, seven days a week, travel all over the country, eight, nine, ten cities a month different countries I go to. I just came back from Australia and New Zealand. I've been in Canada. I've been in, in the United Kingdom. I've been in Switzerland and Sweden and Scotland and Ireland. So you say you do the same thing on a Sunday that you've done it all day? Well, let, let me answer the question this way. Like the Palestine. We did not win World War II. I'm going to tell you that right now wasn't bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that won World War II. It was December 9, 1945, we signed the United Nations Treaty. That's what stopped the war. We became a United Nations country. We gave Manhattan Island in New York. Rudy Giovanni gets up on, on, on camera, and he was asked, can't you do something about all those United Nations traffic tickets that New York gets, there's millions of dollars in unpaid traffic tickets. He goes, I don't have any control over Manhattan Island. That's its own city, nation, state, just like the Vatican and just like D.C. Okay? Do you know in that same document, we gave him 50 miles of land along the Mexican border on both sides. How did the United States give him 25 miles of Mexico. Answer that. Think about that for a minute. 25 miles of Mexico, 25 miles of the United States on both sides of the border, 50 miles wide is the United Nations property. And they're not even going to tell you it is. They lead us to believe. What about all those farmers that got ranches right on the border who complain all the time about the Mexicans coming across the river and Illegals are coming up through their ranch. and I know a lady who just became a widow down there because her husband was killed by illegals coming onto their ranch. She says, what do I do, David? I said, buy an AR-12, extra 10-round clips, load every other round with slug and double out buck and keep it handy. Lean it against the front door because you're vulnerable. You're a single woman, elderly, living alone on a ranch that borders the river with another country where there's a lot of foreign invaders. That's what I told her to do. Sound advice for all of us, by the way. All right? So, most important documents. The only two documents that are required. Is it all we should do? No. You need to do more. Why do you need to do more? Because we, one, another most important thing in law is intent. You have to have the intent to commit a crime. Very few attorneys want to bring this up in court, by the way. If you're talking one-on-one, -on -one, they'll bring it up. But if you go in a courtroom, you'll almost never. Right. 
You'll almost never hear an attorney say that in court. In private, a, a, a decent one, a decent moral human being that happens to be an attorney, <laughs> and there are a few, but they are compartmentalized legal idiots again. We'll bring it up occasionally. But intent is very, very important in the law. You have to have the intent to commit a crime. I stood in a federal court on behalf of a friend who had already been convicted, went to the sentencing. I wanted to see what the sentencing was going to do. I, I almost rather go to sentencing than I would the actual trials. And I went on behalf of a friend to watch the sentencing. And I said, hey, ask the judge where your intent was to commit a crime. And he says, Your Honor, can I say something? And he said, yeah. And he says, where was my intent to commit the crime? And the judge looked over at the prosecutor and goes, you did not prove intent. And he dismissed the case and we all went home. <laughs> yeah. That simple on that particular case. Not all of them are that way. Some of them, you can beat them to death and you're still going to lose, right? Because you don't have a crystal ball and you don't know what they know. And they're not going to reveal their secrets. So you've got to watch out for bear traps. Anytime you're in a courtroom, they're full of bear traps. Don't step in one. And it's really easy to do by opening your mouth. The more you can remain silent, the better off you're going to be. Plead the fifth if you can. Don't say anything in the car, in the cop car, to the cop, in the interrogation room while you're being booked. Don't say any words in the jail. They record everything. Don't talk on the phone to your wife or your girlfriend while you're in the jail because they record every conversation. And they will find out by your court date. That judge will have heard every phone call conversation you've ever had. <laughs> okay? They know everything. And they listen to everything. Most people incriminate themselves prior to trial over the telephone to their family. Yeah. I don't care how good your documents are or your presentation in court and how good of actor you are. You talk to your wife over the phone at a jail. You say the wrong thing. And you can be as perfect of an attorney while you're up there and represent yourself all you want and we'll talk about that word because no one should represent themselves. You are yourself. Be yourself. Be Sue Juris. That's how we go to court. That's how a private American goes to court. We appear by special appearance only, not general appearance. You go to court sue juris. Don't you go to court pro se unless you're suing someone else like a judge or a prosecutor and you're trying to put them in jail. Then if you want to go pro se or pro per, you can. But even then, you're better off sue juris. But if you're defending yourself, don't ever be a pro. Because if you're a pro, you're a professional. You're a professional self. That's pro se. Or you're a professional persona. That's pro per. Yeah. You don't want to represent yourself. You are yourself. You're a man, a son of God, a living soul with full, unalienable rights when you're sued jurist. Some of you are going, well, crap, that's how I lost in court. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I'm, I'm telling you, courts are very easy to win. I've been probably in over a thousand courtrooms and lost very few. Very few. Huh? 
because they can run over the top of you. And you can make one little mistake that you didn't even realize until a week later. And you think about it and you go, crap, bang head here. If I wouldn't have done that, I would have won. I had a judge one time, we were just walking out losers. One time, this was years ago. And he said, he said, I want you to know you almost had it. Well, thank you, Judge. <laughs> Appreciate it. You almost had You want to expound on that? Tell me exactly what I did wrong so I won't make the same mistake? No. Uh -uh. <laughs> okay. You almost had it. Man, I slunk out of there after that. I thought we did really a good job and couldn't figure out why we lost. But you live and learn, right? That's what we're here on earth for anyway. Don't take it personally. If you go to jail, don't take it personally. You might be in jail just to help your fellow inmates, and God put you there for a reason. Okay? We don't know. He does all kinds of things. I, I know a, I got a good friend named Dave Berger. Dave Berger. Dave Berger has not done anything legal in his life. Love him to death. He is a preacher man 24 hours a day. In fact, my pickup's parked at his house right now. I drive my pickup to his house, and he takes me to the airport, even if it's 4 o'clock in the morning. But Dave has no problem going to a courtroom and getting thrown in jail for contempt. And he doesn't mind at all. It's his opportunity to teach. He gets three meals while he's in there, a bed, a place to sleep, and lots of people to talk to. And he preaches the gospel like nobody's business. He can quote scripture and verse in every verse in every book in the Bible and five different types of Bible. Okay? Dave's a good guy. Love him to death, actually. Not many people can be that dedicated. But he's been to jail, I don't know, 100, 150 times? At least. He was in jail last week, just got out, in time to take me to the airport. <laughs> I'm serious. Scott Wesley Denham, he went to Scott's trial. And he got thrown in jail for contempt. I said, that ain't your trial. How'd you do that? He goes, I ran my mouth off because the judge committed treason. Yeah. Right? I let him know. Anyway, they usually hauled him out in tubs. Almost all, every time he goes to court. Yeah. But he doesn't care. Anyway. Two things required. I do lots of other things. I do a patented nativity. Anybody know what that is? Nope. Well, it kind of is. It kind of is. But a patented nativity is your genealogy. It's your heritage. How long have your has your DNA been on these shores? No? How about your mom, your dad, their grandparents, your great-grandparents, your great-grandparents? Ah, absolutely. Mine got here in 1607. Jamestown, Virginia. Then on the Mayflower, seven of my grandfathers were on the Mayflower. Seven signed the Mayflower Compact. Okay. First boat that hit these shores, as far as America was concerned, I'm not talking about the Egyptians that came. Some of them might have been my relatives too. I've traced over 19,000 of my grandmothers and grandfathers direct back over 2,000 years. A 
show it to you. Let's get together for lunch. I'll show you. I'll get Ancestry.com out, and I'll show you. And go back clear to Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, before that to Pompeii. And go back to Falk Five, who, when I was in Jerusalem, visiting Christ's tomb, Falk Five was king of Jerusalem in 1000 AD. And he's buried right next to Christ's tomb. He was the king of Jerusalem. He was one of my grandfathers. So you start doing your genealogy. It's just really important. Why? Everything in this world revolves around heirship, heritage. Read the Bible. <laughs> that thing is full of hierarchy, right? <clears throat> Patent and nativity says me, my parents, and their parents, tracing back to before this government was put into place. Why do I do that? Because that which came first is most important. We, we created government. My grandfathers have signed the Declaration of Independence. Was it the shot heard around the world at Concord? Signed the Mayflower Compact. Signed the Virginia Declaration. First, first legal document in this country. 1607. You start doing your genealogy, your hierarchy, and you can walk into court with a patent and nativity and say, hey, what right do you have to rule over me when I was here first? That in which one creates, one controls. A maximum of law. Say that 40 times this weekend probably. That in which one creates, one controls. We, the people, created government. We laid down the law. If they don't follow that law, which is our constitutions, our declarations, and our treaties, okay, I can't spell this morning, so bear with me. My brain's not in a spelling mode. How do you spell superior? Oh, man. It might have been because I was at IHOP till 1.30 this morning with a couple trying to help them with their case. Superior, supreme, and not law. <laughs> not law is what I call rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances. They're not law. They're corporate bylaws. I should have wrote corporate bylaws on there. What is superior law? It's God's law. What is supreme law? It's our constitutions, our declarations, and our treaties. They override everything. How many people bring up the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in the courtroom? One. One. Let's talk about that document really quick. That document was written by a private individual, a private man, one guy. And he wrote it in 1960, no, 57. He wrote it in 1957. Took him till 1966 to get it to The Hague. It was 1976. They had a 10-year period for every country in the world to sign on to it. It wasn't going to take effect until 1976. Russia signed it in 1992, and the United States of America held out until 1993. They waited until Russia had signed the document. Now get this. We're one of the only countries that signed that document with a condition. Makes me proud. The condition we signed the document with was Articles 1 through 27, which happens to be the Bill of Rights section of the document, 
shall not be self-executing. What does that mean? That means they're not going to put it in our school books and teach us about it. They're not going to bring it up on our behalf in court. And they're not going to put it in any of our codes. It shall not be self-executing. But it doesn't mean that if you should learn about it, if you should bring it up in court, it says right in the document that all governments who sign the treaty at every level, right down to our local municipalities, must obey it. So I started putting it in my documents. Articles 1 through 27, put them in my court documents, filed it in probably a thousand courthouses across the country. And what happened? They, start, they for the most part, were ignoring it. So I went before the Hague, flew my butt over to the Europe with a group of people, and we told the United Nations that the United States Department of Justice and its court system is ignoring our human rights treaty. And they wrote a nice little letter to the State Department that said, you better knock it off. And the State Department wrote a nice little letter to the Department of Justice saying, you better knock it off. And they actually put an article in the ABA journal telling lawyers and judges they better knock it off. Now, does that mean they're all going to do that? Huh? Um, I think it was about two years ago. Yeah, not very long ago. But they said... That at least they were told they better knock it off. Now, are all of them going to follow that? No. Nobody's got a crystal ball. Nobody knows what they're going to do. There's bear traps everywhere, right? Try not to step in them. <laughs> if you do, you go to jail. ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, goes hand in hand with the uni uh, the. Thank you. My RAM's a little short this morning. <laughs> I got a big hard drive, but this morning I got very little RAM to pull it up with. <laughs> International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Articles 1 through 27 is what you need to pay attention to. That's the Bill of Rights section of the document. Okay. Very, very important document. Use it in your court cases. What we're trying to talk about here today is things you should be doing, concrete things that will help any situation you're in. Don't let these judges, prosecutors, police officers, perceived authority get away with things, anything. Do not let them get away. How, does it, how is power created? It's created by vacuum. Power is created by vacuum. Yesterday I said everything in life is about good versus evil. We talked about that. And remember the triangle and the little lines below it that I said you can put it, the name of every organization in there and as people rise to the top, what happens? They get controlled by those that stepped up. It's created by a vacuum. You guys don't step up to the plate and stop letting them get away with things. So how do you define ICCPR in that section of the Bill of Rights? Is that what you mean? One of the amendments, no one has a greater right to their child than a parent. So do you, I mean, what would you, what would you see in that? Is that anything that yeah. A writ, an error of coram nobis, uh, it, whatever your document you're doing in court. If it fits your situation and what you're doing, go to your search engine, type in ICCPR. Print off the PDF. Look at Articles 1 through 27. Look at them really good. If one of them fits your situation, 
use it in your court documents. If it's an affidavit, you know, item number seven could be the ICCPR, a, 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 a treaty signed by the United States government, which must be followed by every municipality, says, number six, no one has a greater right to my child than I do. Just help you in your CPS cases right there. Okay, use these documents. Our rights are unalienable. That's how unalienable should be spelled. Un, a, uh, lean, able. That's how I write it in my court documents. I'm dealing with a compartmentalized legal idiot called a judge or a prosecutor. Anybody that brings a case against somebody is a prosecutor. You could be a prosecutor. Anybody could be a prosecutor. Okay? Unalienable. Why? They cannot lean you against an unalienable right. My Second Amendment is my gun permit. You see? That is a right. It's a private, personal right. Nobody can take it away from me. What does it say? Shall not, that's a commandment, shall not be infringed. Right? Okay. Anything, unalienable. Know what your rights are. They're all given to us by God, not some government. But they're written down somewhere. They're in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They're in the ICCPR. They're in our Bill of Rights. They're in our Declarations of Independence. They're in our state constitutions. They're written down. They're enumerated. Use them in all your documents. Be a belligerent claimant in person. Belligerent doesn't mean rude. I'm going to say that again. Belligerent doesn't mean to be nasty, however you want to say it. You treat them as your neighbor, and you stand firmly upon your rights. When I go into court, I don't wear a suit and a tie. I dress just like I'm dressed today, and I stand at military attention, and I put my right foot slightly forward. And when I'm talking to the judge, I talk to the judge, just like this. And when I'm talking to the jury, I talk to the jury. And when I'm calling the prosecutor an ass and telling him he's committing capital felony treason, I look right at the prosecutor. But my feet never move. And I use my hands when I talk to him. And I talk to him just like this. With authority. They are my public servants. If you go in there all wimpy and scared and frightened, your own fear is only from a lack of knowledge. Okay? That's it. Once you can out-debate them all, you're not scared of nothing. In fact, they start shaking in their boots. You want to see judges shake? I've made them shake. I've made them run out of the room. Completely run out of the room. Absolutely. Absolutely. The captain abandoned his post. Court clerk, please dismiss this case with prejudice. And you just walk out and don't say another word. If you say anything else, you've lost. Any, if you say anything between there and the door, you've lost. Don't say anything. <coughs> Plead the fifth. Every chance you get, keep your mouth shut. Most people get into trouble because they talk too much. If you don't believe me, go to YouTube and watch some Sovereign Citizen videos. Okay? God, I hate that term. You can either be sovereign or you can be a citizen, and we're all sovereign. And there's nothing to be ashamed about that. Start writing with purple. Okay. 
put a red thumbprint on your document. Do I do that all the time? No. But I do write with purple. Sometimes I don't like to poke my finger. I've had enough pain in my life, believe me. What's that? It's because you can put emphasis on something. Even, even an officer giving a commandment to his troops will put his right foot forward just a little bit. And as he puts his weight on that foot, he pops right at them. Now, he may be screaming and yelling like my drill sergeant, and cussing up a storm, but he's direct. And he's to the point. And that's how we have to be in court. Just like I'm being with you right now. Direct to the point. I'm looking you guys in the eye and I'm pointing at you what I'm doing. See how my gun hand follows my eyes? Don't ever take your eyes off the sights. You do, you die. Right? First thing I learned in training. You do, you die. This is how you walk through a room, right? This, this is how you do things. This is how you do things in court. Now, you don't point your gun finger, but just talk to them, okay? They might get a little intimidated and shoot you. And the U.S. Marshals have tasers. And good attorneys who stand up for their clients do get tased in court. Okay? Because they become a traitor to the bar. Understand that. Go to your search engine and type in list of disbarred lawyers. That's who you want to ask for help. First of all, they're not being allowed to work, so they need the money. So they'll work cheap, and you know if they're disbarred, they've been defending their clients. Now, there might be a few criminals in there, so you do got to weed them out. But if you want to find good legal help, and I don't mean to represent you, but to offer help and suggestions and policy and procedure, because that's all they learn in school. They don't learn the law in law school. Do you get that? Should I, I need to say that again. I took six people in a car physically to two law schools. And we sat down with the administration and we said, hey, we want to make a late in life career change. We're going to do this together. Took all six of us, walked in, sat down in their offices. And I said, here's what we need. We need a list of classes that we would need to take to get a degree in the law and pass the bar. And we went to two law schools in the same day. Lewis and Clark Law School, which seems to be all of Bill Clinton's famous attorneys that he appointed graduated, and Willamette University Law, School of Law. And we sat down with the admin, and we got a list of classes. And we took them to a restaurant. We were there five hours, and we analyzed all these classes. And like any other college, 30% of them are electives courses. So you might have a Constitutional 101 that's an elective. All the rest are policy and procedure, how to remain in honor and not dishonor, language, 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 how to look things up on Westlaw, what software to use to properly write a document, how to use a computer, how to spell and write properly, punctuate, styles, Where's the class on the United States Code? Where's the class on our constitutions and our treaties? I'm talking about supreme law. Where's the Bible classes? There wasn't any. Lawyers do not learn the law unless they do it voluntarily and take an elective. They could take underwater basket weaving instead. 
Do you understand that? How do they learn the law? Well, they pick it up as they go along. As soon as they graduate from law school and they get their bar degree, hopefully they get recruited by some big law firm. But if they don't, they go out and they hang up a shingle called the business sign and rent some office space somewhere. And mom and pop, who needs help, really needs help, maybe their kids were just taken, come in for a one hour or a half hour free consultation to get some advice. And he listens to their story. And then he watches them drive out the parking lot. As soon as they're long gone, he turns to his legal help, his, his research assistant, and he says, look up all the laws that pertain to this. Go, go to Westlaw and look up all the laws that pertain to this. Case, what he wants is case law, not law. So he wants some statutory but he wants mainly case law. And that's what the paralegals are taught to do, to look up and research case law. And then the lawyer sits down at his computer, and he begins a good typist. He becomes a good typist and a good speller. And he knows how to formulate a writ or a motion. That's what your attorney does. See, what he's really trained to do in law school is to a turn, to be a good actor. They get up on stage and they practice being a lawyer in courts, mock court trials. They get up there on stage to be a good actor. To what is an actor? I said this a couple times last couple days. What is an actor? Somebody who gets up on stage and lies convincingly enough to make you believe in the character and the plot. That is the legal definition of an actor. A liar. <laughs> what is to a turn? To steal from one and turn over to an another. So by the very definition of their profession, they're liars and thieves. I can't say that enough. Let's bankrupt them all. Don't hire and pay your money to hire an attorney, ever. Learn the basics of law. You want to hold court? You get in there by special appearance. Your very first document when you go to a court, everybody got this? David. Yes. Point of order, about 15 minutes to a break? Okay. Okay. You're, you're the moderator, buddy. You control the meeting because I'm not even looking at the time. I can talk till 2, 3 in the morning most times. So, very first document. You get a letter in the mail that says, you done something wrong. <laughs> they all say that when they come in your all caps name, right? <laughs> or it's a bill. You've done something wrong, and you might have to appear in court in 30 days. What's the very first document you do? I'm going to put this word in there, but it's really called a notice of appearance. Do I know how to spell? I wish somebody would come up here and write for me. I'll just tell you what to write. Really? I don't know if I've ever had anybody do that. It's your first document. Doesn't have to be long. Could be as short as one page. One page document. I, mine are usually a little more wordy. But what is a notice of appearance? It is how you are going to appear in court. Write down the word summons. See, they're summoning you into court. What does the word summons mean in the law? Uh-uh. Nope. Seance. 
Watch, it's seance. Summons is seance. He's going to go, how do I spell seance? I would have too. <laughs> okay, I use a dictionary when I write. I, I, I got that theory of like Einstein. I used to have a photographic memory, and I put a lot of data in here. But as I'm getting older, it just doesn't come out as quick. Right? Hey, good job. What is a seance? They're calling the dead. They're dressed in black. This is a satanic ritual. Do you understand that? Yeah. If you don't understand that, might as well go home. Just bend over. Let them ream you every time they get a chance. Because they will. Because if you don't appear and tell them ahead of time via your paperwork, what is your paperwork? What is a court of record? I say this over and over again. There's a reason. A court of record is your paperwork. It's not the brick building, but it's your paperwork properly served and publicly published. It's not just your paperwork. It's got to be properly served to all opposing parties and publicly published, and then you put it in the court. How do you publicly publish something? You record it with the county recorder if you can find one that'll do it. In Oregon, there's one county for an extra 20 bucks on top of what they normally charge. They'll record any document. I guess there's a, there's a county, I forget the name of it, in Georgia that'll record any document for 10 bucks. Well, Mark County, that's right. The minute you said it, I knew. Ravalli County, Montana is another one. Ravalli County, Montana, the entire county was put under a God trust. Yeah. So I went to Ravalli County to record my God trust. All right, we'll talk about that later. <coughs> publicly recorded or publicly published. You can publish something by putting it in the newspaper for 21 days. That's Get it. The same as recording. It's same as recording. You can put it on a bulletin board with witnesses who are willing to do an affidavit stating that they watched you. They're a first-hand witness, and they watched you put it on the bulletin board on such and such a date at such and such a time and that it's been there 21 days. So you can get affidavits. That's a hard way to do it, you know. Go ahead. What's that? Sure. You could. You could. That's inconvenient for most of America, but yeah. <laughs> you can. So there's all kind of, there's different ways to publicly publish something. You could you could go to Amazon and write a book with your legal documents and publish it on Amazon.com. Sell it to people if you want for 99 cents or whatever it is. They'll take half your profit. But publish a, you can publish a book. Okay, So there's many ways to do that. But a summons is a seance. They are summoning the dead. They are calling the dead. It's a satanic ritual. So you have to say, wait a minute, I cannot appear by general appearance, right? General appearance guy. <coughs> Most people walk into a courtroom <laughs> and they just show up. And they don't announce how they're appearing. And they don't announce in the courtroom how they're appearing. So you're there by general appearance. You answered the summons. You showed up. And the judge says, oh, I don't care what you say. You showed up, so I have jurisdiction. Have them actually say that. You don't just show up. If you show up, you're under general appearance. Bad. Okay? Let's get simple here. That's bad. Special appearance. And I go one step further, and I say special divine appearance. Why do I use the word divine? Because I'm a living soul. 
Genesis 2, 7. And I, God, created man from the dust of the earth, and I breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Every document I have says a living soul. Is it five minutes up? Okay. We can take a break. Look at that. You see that? Not one single person stood up. That's how you know you're starting to be listened to. David? My first classes for 10 years, there'd be 10, 20 people once a month maybe if I could get one together. And people would run out the door when I was done. And I learned I was making it too complicated. And I learned I was talking too fast. I used to talk really quick. Yeah, we got about five minutes before. I was just giving you five minutes heads oh. up. But I really wanted to comment on this as well and uh, not to steal your thunder at all, not at all, just to add to. Um, I went and read quite a bit up on the subject he's talking about, about general appearance and special appearance. And uh, a special appearance is qualified, and if you go back and you can find this in the Black's Law Dictionary, if you look up appearance, and there's a couple types of appearances they mention there. One is general and one is special. General appearance, you agree to the jurisdiction of the court, just a blank agreement to the jurisdiction of the court. A special appearance only has two things that you can do, that they recognize that you're there by special appearance. A lot of people think it's like putting in Jesus' name, amen, on the end of their prayer. Oh, I'm here by special appearance. They do whatever they want. Special appearance is qualified by only being there for two purposes. And you go back and read this for yourself, and I recommend you do. Under appearance, get in the Black's Law Dictionary and look at what they're looking at, because this is what they're looking at. That's their spell book. And they'll, w they'll watch you and they'll weigh you. And if you want to win, I'm just giving you an understanding of how they think. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm not saying you should think that way. I'm just telling you that's the way they think. A special appearance, you can only do two things. Does anyone know what those are? Just curious. Challenge the jurisdiction of the court. Second? Call for a summary judgment. Su sufficiency of service of process is what Black's Law says. And that, and that is a very interesting qualifying phrase, sufficiency of service of process. Because to have sufficiency of service of process, they have to have the correct person in the correct capacity qualified for the act with intent. All of that is part of the suffici uh, sufficiency of service of process. That's right. Did they actually serve you. Are you the party to that act? It is due process of law. But you want to get talk for a few more minutes before we take a break at 1045? You can't hey, just want to throw that out there. You're the moderator. I misread your fingers. Okay. And I don't need this. Mission to the jurisdiction of the court. That's why most of you lose right there. The latter, a submission to the jurisdiction for some special purpose only, not for all purposes of the suit. Right. So what is the special purposes only? That is, first of all, determining jurisdiction. When I hold court, I ask some very specific questions of the judge. And I know I just keep repeating this. It feels like I've said this a million times to me. <laughs> All right. What is the law? Where did its origins come from? How did we arrive at this thing called law where a small group of men could write something down on paper and hold me a man accountable? Judge? What is it? Let's write to keep it short. First thing you got to establish is what jurisdiction you're in. You're not appearing by summons or seance. You're just accepting the invitation to settle the matter. You're appearing by special divine appearance. What is that? Tell, talk about your jurisdiction. Who are you, first of all? The paperwork's got your all caps name up there, right? Is that you? No, that's your persona, your entity, your vessel. It's an investment account. <laughs> it's a, it's a, 
entities, corporations, whatever you want to call it, all means the same, you're in trouble. That's what it means. If you get something in the mail and you're all caps name, you're usually in trouble or you're in debt. Okay? So you say, put your all caps name up there, state of Oregon versus David Lester Strait, all caps, and then I write two little words underneath that that says in air. Yeah. Yeah. I let them know that's in air. Just like that. It says that right under my all caps name. And then it says, by special appearance, special divine appearance, appears David Lester straight written just like that. It's right out of the Chicago style manual. Proper language. It's, it's quantum syntax grammar. Full stop colon gives your name importance. Your given name, that one was given to me by my mother. That one was given to me because it's my dad's brother's name. So it was given to me by my dad. This is not a given name at all. I inherited it. I had no choice. My dad didn't have a choice. But I inherited it. So it begins a new sentence. This has the major meaning, major importance. Starts with a full stop, ends with a full stop. Technically, my name is David Lester. Has nothing to do with that. Who uses surnames? Do you know what Norwegian countries like Sweden and Norway used to do to protect their children and their grandchildren from the king? If my name is Dave, was David Lester Strait and I had a son, which I do, named Christopher, I'm going to shorten it to Chris, and his name is Chris David, Thank you, whoever said that. Who said it? Yeah, who said it? Okay. Yeah. His name would have been Chris, Christopher, David, David's son. And if he had a son, and let's just say he named him David Daniel. I'm using you, Dan. David Daniel. Christopherson, Christopher's son. That's how we ended up with so many last names in the world, mainly our Norwegian countries. Okay, he says time's up. Huh? Special divine appearance. I'm lazy this morning, not writing it all out. So, so we're going to take a, a short break. And I'm not going to give you time because you guys like to talk, and there's coffee, and there's a line, and all that. So we'll just try to track with you. There's coffee and goodies downstairs. Um, get a good smell at the lunch that we're going to have, and we'll announce lunch at this next break. And uh, what I'd like to do is, when we come back, yep. I was told by uh, Pastor Put Tony back there that all of the questions are not coming out on the recording, and that makes it difficult because you really want to track with it. So if you'd like, I'm, I'm right there. I can see everybody's hand. When you want to ask a question of David, put your hand up, and I'll hand you the mic when we come back. Can we all agree to do that, please, because it'll help the recording. Go ahead and have a break. We'll just take, we'll come back in a little bit. <laughs> 